Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to see all of you on Friday here and the uh, annual meeting of new champions as we um, sort of round up some of the discussions. We've had a lot of great discussions in the last couple of days about science uh, and research and technologies that grow out of the basic research and how they can affect and improve our lives. And today's discussion will, uh, I think, form a nice wrap on, on some of these. There have been actually quite, quite a few sessions. We're, we're going to be, I hope you're here because you're ready to attend and listen to the Ingenuity is Not Enough discussion. And the main charge of this panel is going to be to discuss what enables complex, collaborative, and long-term innovations. So how do, we, how do we drive the basic research and the innovations that we need to solve some of society's greatest challenges? So um, I, I have a, a, a wonderfully distinguished group of folks with me here today, which I'm just delighted to introduce you to. I'm going to say their names and um, affiliations for you just really quickly, and then we'll begin the conversation. Mm -hmm. I'd like you, as you're listening to us, to please think about things you might like to ask after a few minutes of framing. We will we'll give the audience an opportunity, as we always do, to continue the discussion through, through the forum. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your insights as well. So uh, just to my left here is Bruce Andrews, the U.S. Depart Deputy Secretary of Commerce. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Fersman, CEO of One Qubit Information Technologies in Canada. Welcome. Susan Fortier, Principal of uh, McGill University, yeah. Canada. Nice to see you. Um, Eric Chen, Founder and Director of Vitagen, People's Republic of China. Nice Thank to you. see you. And um, Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, President of the European Research Council based in Belgium. Nice to see you. So as you've just heard, um, the panelists here all have very different perspectives to bring. So I, I've had a chat with them just ahead and I would really like each of them to speak to you uh, about, to give you a couple of quick points to think about when thinking about fostering innovation over time. Could we start with you? Sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here this morning. Um, well, it's fascinating to look around the stage because what we see is, as you've made reference, all of the different pieces of the innovation ecosystem. And from our perspective, from the Department of Commerce perspective, we are America's innovation agency. And what we do is focus on what is it that the US federal government can do to help create the conditions that allow growth, allow innovation, um, and frankly, allow entrepreneurship to thrive. And we do that in a number of ways. We do that through funding basic research, which we are not the only agency within the federal government, but um, we have several, agent, several of our sub-agencies are big funders of basic research, which is obviously hugely important. Um, we protect the intellectual property through our patent and trademark office, another critical piece of the uh, equation. We have our economic development administration, which w works with local communities, trying to help them identify, you know, as one piece of the ecosystem, what the role that the local communities can play and providing seed capital and ability to uh, spread innovation in their regions. And then last is our uh, International Trade Administration, which plays a key role because one of the things we've really tried to focus on is um, you know, innovation starts, but in a rapidly changing world, innovation is global almost immediately. And what, you know, traditionally companies, when they grow, they start out in their domestic market and then they grow internationally. And one of the things that we've recognized is it doesn't work that way anymore. It's too fast. The world is too fast. Things are too rapidly changing. So how can we help startups from their earliest points go global and really recognize that exporting and being part of a global community uh, will help them to be successful in the long term? Thank you. I realize I got so excited uh, to speak with all of you, I forgot to say who I am. I'm, I'm, <laughs> It's, it's Friday. I'm Mariette DeCristina. I'm the editor-in-chief of Scientific America, and I'm also the uh, vice chair of the Meta Council on Emerging Technologies. So I have some uh, self-interest in listening to the observations of the panelists here as well. And actually, um, after hearing this, uh, this opening, it seems to me, uh, Professor Bourguignon, perhaps you could speak a little bit about the perspective that the European Research Council is taking. Yes, thank you. 
Uh, well, actually, I'm uh, at one end of the spectrum in a sense because uh, the European Research Council uh, is a program of the European Commission which has been set up to really uh, give the um, responsibility to the researchers. So it was something which for a long time was not part of the responsibility of the European Commission to really support research. Uh, it was really, research was there only as a tool to uh, increase the um, uh, collaboration between countries or wealth creation and all of a sudden it was decided, it was a long struggle, to, to res that research should be also a shared responsibility of the European Commission. So the way we do it then uh, in uh, relation with the uh, ingenuity is not enough. Uh, topic. Um, I think uh, maybe three points that I can bring forward. Uh, the, the first one is um, the, uh, the fact that uh, the way we, we try to get scientists to, to be involved in this process is to really, uh, in a sense, push them to their boundaries. That is really to, to tell them that uh, they may be supported by the European Research Council if they come up with a really ambitious project, which means, first of all, the support we give is typically five years long, which is uh, quite substantial, uh, helps people to really take a long-term view, and so that's the first point. The second point is that um, the European Research Council is covering all disciplines from uh, uh, physics, engineering, mathematics, uh, um, life sciences, and also social sciences, humanities. And one thing we, we tried very hard, and I, uh, we know it's difficult, and uh, I'm not sure we have the exact uh, right uh, instrument for that, but we are struggling with this, is to really foster interdisciplinarity. We know that a lot of these uh, very critical uh, new developments will happen at the boundaries of domains, so we don't want the uh, scientists, we want to give it the possibility for scientists who really have ideas of uh, bridging gaps to, to really come up with such ideas. And the last point, which uh, also is uh, very important for us, which uh, echoes what you, what you said about uh, globality, is that uh, we definitely want to, uh, the, I mean, the program of the European Research Council is definitely open to the world. So that is, we are absolutely willing uh, to apply and to get support. You don't have to uh, be European, but also more than that, you don't have to be fully based in Europe. That is, you can be based in Europe for part of your time. And now it's quite clear that a number of institutions in the world have really accepted the principle, and China is a very good example of a country which has accepted the, this principle, that maybe people can be sharing their time between the institutions, which actually uh, looks like a complicated scheme, but uh, it's quite clear that it's an extremely efficient way of, uh, I mean, really mixing cultures, mixing approaches, and giving opportunities to people. So this is uh, where we are at the moment, but definitely I'm a scientist, I'm at one end of the thing. Uh, but uh, it was the initiative of the Scientific uh, Council of ERC who is in charge of defining the program to, to really uh, actually open up towards innovation because we have a smaller program called uh, Proof of Concept in which we do want to accompany the scientists to feel that they have a possibility of a connection to uh, to in more industrial or more societal challenges, developments, uh, to accompany them in doing their first steps. We know there are many more steps needed to get to a company, but at least uh, with our own money, we decided it was worth uh, going in this direction. And the, the good surprise, which uh, now it's not anymore a surprise, is the fact that uh, many scientists are very eager to participate and the competition to get this extra mark fund is, uh, is getting tough. So it means we have to put more money in this uh, direction. Thank you. So, so it's not, thank you. It sounds like always a challenge for the, for the scientists to, to come up. It's a, a merit-based, of course, always. So it seems maybe natural to speak a little from the academic perspective yes, then. Yes. So uh, ingenuity is not enough. I mean, when you think about this, you realize that it's a very tough world in which we live. And our job in universities to prepare these generations, new generations for this world. So what do they need? Being smart is not enough. Being creative and smart is not enough. You need more than that. And you need to be able to work in the innovation world. And to me, innovation is a team sport. So you need to be able to work with people. That means you have to be truly a global citizen, not only global in the sense that you're geographically or culturally global, you've got to be able to look at the world from different perspectives, different areas of knowledge. Uh, that's tough. And uh, you have to, of course, be sensitive to uh, different culture. And one thing you need to do is to be resilient. That's very, very difficult. 
And you need to learn that as a team to be resilient. So this is the kind of world we need to prepare our students for. And I think this is what we're really focusing on. What do we do to provide a learning environment for our students today that will equip them well for this world? I want to say just one thing about resilience, because what is resilience? You know, to me, it's a mixture of a number of things. It's character, it's human qualities, and it's skills. And just ask yourself, how do you learn that? It's very difficult, but it is so important. And I want to end with a story, because I think it's the most important, one of the most important things that I've learned this year, right at New Year, actually, from a friend who's a sailor. He's crossed the ocean in his sailboat several times, and he's faced huge storms. I was amazed. This is the last thing I would want to do, <laughs> is be in a storm in the middle of the ocean with a, bit, with a small boat. He said something to me. I said, how do you do that? How do you get through this? He says, you know, the ship is 10 times braver than the crew. And you have to remember that. You have to know that your ship is good. You have to believe in your ship. And you have to inspire your team, your crew, to believe in it. And that's how you get to it. The ship will not sink. The crew will sink the ship. And when I look at some of the failures in business, often I would say, it's not the ship, it's the crew. So we have to prepare our students also to be a good crew member and to have that kind of belief in what they do and in what their team does so that they'll be able to face the storms which inevitably will be in front of them. So I, I think it's, it's, it's great to reflect on their there are multidisciplinarity you were mentioning, coming at it from different angles, different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it, a key part of this is a word I've heard start to come up is transdisciplinarity. So yes. if we were going to build that ship and crew it right, yeah. we have to make sure we have quite a variety of, of, yes. of, of yes. folks in there. Yes. So maybe, maybe now some from the business perspective I think would be useful. Mr. Yes. Mr. Chen, what are things that seem to be working for you for establishing long term? Yeah, I want to echo with the professor that uh, resilience is very important because uh, when I was young, uh, still young, <laughs> I uh, used to play baseball for China. So uh, I'm very physically and mentally fit to be an entrepreneur because it's the resilience you gain from that sports training. Yeah. And uh, after I retire from the youth league and uh, I come to Hong Kong for study. And uh, the, um, I want to use myself as a, a story how we start the innovation because we are an innovator this year. So in 2008, uh, there was a very famous Olympic Games, Beijing Olympic Games that we are so proud of as a sportsman. But in one month, right after that, there was the milk powder scandal that shocked the world. So I was thinking, I mean, our country has become stronger. The people have become richer. How come the only source of food, milk powder for babies are still so dangerous? So we do a lot of research and realize that in the environment, there are more than 100,000 chemicals out there. But the existing like regulations and testing method can only test for like five or 10 or 20 chemicals. So there's a huge gap. So when people say, oh, this water, bottle of water is safe to drink, it means that they test for maybe 10 or 20 chemicals. The other thousands are not tested yet. So our innovation is that we use, um, we genetically modify a fish, a real fish, like uh, yes. this one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when the fish detect toxin, it can screen like thousands of toxin in one time. And when it detect toxin, it will become fluorescent and the intensity of the fluorescence can quantify the toxin for food, cosmetics, and water. And so it's the breakthrough technology, but it doesn't stop there. Because when we think, oh, we have a very good technology, we think we can promote to the whole world, save the human being, and conquer the world. But that's not the, the fact, because when we face enterprises, when we face governments, I mean, um, they are more reluctant than we, we think. We, we, th we thought they would use it immediately, but they are not. They think, oh, this is too much trouble for them. They don't want to take the risk, et cetera. So the innovation starts from the technology and then to the business model that we try to build a position to help them instead of uh, making too much trouble for them. So we try to tell them that if the downside is that if you don't do it today, we announce certain kind of uh, food index that if your product or your company is not on that list, yes. the consumers and investors will, will ask you questions. And, and also the upside is that if you move fast, you become the leader in this one, and uh, you can have a much better brand differentiation, you can have a much better uh, profit margin. So I think uh, for us, I mean, the innovation is not only from the technology, it's also very important from your position, from your business model. Sometimes it's even more important than the technology. And the second point I want to throw out is that 
uh, where is the innovation come from? When people think about innovation, they always think about technology. But I think more important, they also is in business model, and the source is not just from the scientists. It's also very important to, from your customers, because sometimes the scientists think, oh, they, they, they have a PhD, they know a lot in this sector, but sometimes they may, there will be some disconnection from the uh, customer. So our approach is very market driven. For example, uh, we have the fish that can test many different kinds of food, but what kind of food we should start with? And uh, last year there was this um, drinkage oil scandal in China. Maybe you heard of people recycle the oil from, from the drinkage and then use for our food. Another great invention, but this is not a great one. Uh, so <laughs> we, uh, we said, oh, this is a good opportunity for us. And the market needs it because everybody is so afraid of um, the, 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 the edible oil. So we modify the fish. So we are the first one that can use the fish to test to differentiate good edible oil and bad edible oil. So this is another example that actually the innovation can come from the market, come from your customers. So that's a great example actually about how it can come in. So I, I think we're getting a broader picture now, but we haven't yet talked about how do you, how do you support that over time? So I think uh, given your work in, in one qubit and, and your interest in financial models and so on, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, so I mean, I can only speak from my experience um, as the co-founder and CEO of a small technology company in Canada. Um, but really, you know, we started off understanding that there was this awesome opportunity to capitalize on this new technology of quantum computers. We knew that, I mean, just recently, um, Alibaba and uh, Intel have announced big programs. Uh, IBM, Google, D-Wave have all been producing this hardware. And we we're really excited to be thinking about, you know, great technology is interesting, but it becomes really interesting when you can connect it to industry applications. Um, and so really our research focus, and we are a very research focused organization, or we have a strong research pedigree, is to be thinking about how we can put some intellectual horsepower toward thinking about connecting this technology uh, to these future applications. But because it is future applications, I know it's cliched to say, but it does sort of take a village to make this happen. Mm -hmm. And for us, uh, you know, starting off in Canada, it was very easy to get the first little bits of seed money. Uh, you know, people are excited about this technology, but as you start to grow up and you start looking around to get the resources necessary in order to really make a, a sort of world-class organization, um, you have to start bringing in the government policies need to be there in order to support this kind of private research. You need to have the strong universities that we can hire from and be able to bring in the talent from, uh, especially we're in Vancouver, which is a big city in Canada, but a small city in the world. And so having strong university partners there has been excellent. Um, looking at the uh, policies that the government has put in place in order to reward R&D and to make sure that it's possible for people who are doing these sort of uh, risky technology businesses to be able to capitalize on things like, you know, I mean, it's, it's clear that you're going to put a lot of money in up front and get money out the back end. So what things can be done in order to make it so that you get tax advantages and, and things of that nature things that make it rewarding for investors to make an admittedly risky investment and be able to really see the reward of it in the long term. Uh, obviously, society will benefit if people are making these breakthrough technologies, but these technologies won't happen if there aren't the proper incentives to actually get people to go and, and put these things together. So, I mean, I like to think that we bring the ingenuity to the table, but you're right, ingenuity is not enough because without having all of the venture capital and policy and uh, human capital in place, we wouldn't be able to do any of this stuff. I think those are all great points. And before I go uh, over to the audience, I'm just wondering from the, from the panelists, um, we've been talking, I think, broad, kind of broadly about some of the challenges, the, the connections we need to make, the stakeholders that need to be involved. Can we be a little bit more specific? Are there any models of public or private, public-private mechanisms that really work mm -hmm. for fostering innovation over time? Is, can, you, can you give us a case study or an example mm -hmm. of something that's worked well? Sure. Well, I can, I can speak to actually a couple from the perspective of the United States government. I mean, you start with, with looking at the Internet. 
I mean, the internet ultimately it is, in some ways, the ultimate upfront investment of government money to develop something. Frankly, I don't think anyone ever imagined, well, I think maybe a couple visionaries imagined what it would grow into, but it was really the initial investments were to cr try to create a way for government research institutions to communicate with each other. And then you took that ingenuity, you took the academia, you took the researchers and added to that and frankly, it created this incredible engine of growth that we now see today as a result. I'll give you another example, which is something we're, we're working on right now, which is um, in the United States, we have created a national network for manufacturing initiatives. And what we have done is essentially gone out and said, okay, what are the manufacturing technologies of the future and how do we get them? And so first, working with the private sector, we identified what are the areas of the future that we need basic research. We then created these manufacturing hubs and we now have six of them and we're, we're, put, we're uh, rolling out more uh, in, the, in the coming years. But essentially what the idea is, is bringing together a collaboration where the, the government puts in the seed money and creates the institution, but it is partnered with academic institutions, partnered with businesses. Businesses have put a substantial amount of money and skin in the game to allow to do the basic research that no one company can do on their own, but then you spread that basic research out and allow the companies to take it, develop it further, and commercialize it. So there are some really strong models out there that bring together all of the pieces of the ecosystem and take what starts with an idea and create incredible economic and societal value as a result. Thank you. Dr. Bourguignon, I wonder if you might want to add, uh, from the perspective of Europe, some of the frameworks you've seen that have worked really well. Well, at the moment, Europe is, um, is, is trying something very similar to what has been uh, mentioned by our American uh, colleague here. Namely, uh, the, there has been this uh, European Fund for Strategic Investment, which was uh, the idea that the European Commission would come up with uh, some kind of ga public guarantee of uh, about uh, 16 billion euro, and uh, which uh, to encourage uh, investment in uh, risky uh, um, business. And uh, so the, the whole process now, which is uh, monitored by the European Investment Bank, is uh, about to really get this uh, private fund. And uh, in case they fail, I mean, they do the investment, but then uh, in the end, they don't get uh, what they hope. Uh, there will be this public guarantee to really um, try and uh, um, alleviate the, the kind of uh, resistance uh, to, to, to risk that exists. I mean, the risk aversion, which is uh, very well known. So this is... Um, uh, some people see it as a gamble, uh, some people see it as just the only way forward because uh, you have to mobilize indeed, uh, I mean, public resources, a small amount, a quite large amount of uh, uh, private resources, and this should be very diversified. Of course, part of the uh, interest of uh, Commissioner Moida, who has been here for, for this uh, forum, but also that we are monitoring on the side of uh, ERC is making sure that uh, some of these investments will go to develop uh, some research firms, that it not, doesn't go only to things which are obvious uh, investment, which are very traditional things about the infrastructures and so on. So in a sense, our uh, effort in our case is really to, to really uh, push uh, some ideas which definitely connects uh, and puts research in this uh, ecosystem. So I think, um, I think we've heard some really compelling examples, a couple of really, of the National Network for Manufacturing Initiatives and these strategic investments and how things like the internet, which nobody could have thought at the time. In fact, I think I read somewhere that um, there are something like 20 basic research innovations in iPhones that yeah. a lot of people carry and at the time. Mm -hmm. It was hard to imagine that they would come together in a phone like that. I wonder if we might, at this point, take a question or two from the audience, if anybody's got a burning one. There should be a microphone around. Could we have somebody for this gentleman here? And please say your, your name and um, where you're from. And here it comes. Thank you. My name, my name is Austin, Austin Okere from Computer Warehouse Group, headquartered in Lagos, Nigeria. But I'm also an entrepreneur in residence at Columbia Business School. Uh, my, 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 I agree with Chen when, when he says that uh, ingenuity is not enough. I mean, sitting and, and, and creating a solution that goes to look for problems may not be the, the most optimized way of helping to improve. And there's something about design thinking in the latest edition of the Harvard Business School for Innovation, which means to go to the people you're de developing solutions for to see whether 
the solution is what will meet their need. Uh, an example is women carry two shoes, one to go to the office, which is flat, and one when they are in the office, which is tall and elegant. What about someone sitting back and, and having a brainwave and say, okay, let me make retractable heels. So when they are going to the office, they push in the heel, and then when they get to the office, they pull it out. Now this is ingenuity sitting on your own, but the women probably will not uh, take that because the style and the cut and so on. So how do we bring design thinking into teaching? And I can't see the name, so yeah. this is actually to you. This design thinking, um, how do we bring it into teaching and learning so that ingenuity will meet with practical application? Yes, yeah, okay. Uh, great question. Because this is exactly the kind of questions we're asking ourselves. Uh, how do we provide a learning environment for students that will expose them to uh, the challenges of the world and design uh, thinking into uh, the curriculum? Luckily, and I say luckily, the new generations of students on our campuses are ready for that. I'm amazed, actually, by the fact that they're not content to learn from great professors in the classroom. They're ready from year one to start putting in action with their uh, learning in our classrooms. They start all sorts of initiatives themselves. They design them, they lead them, they implement them. They're really a startup generation and they're really an action generation. A walk the talk, they do it. And so for us, Really, the job is to provide them the kind of support for them to do these sort of initiatives. Coaches, uh, trainers, environment, they need the space, they need some tools, we need to provide them with that. But we need to let them lead and let them design and lead. And what is interesting to me is that uh, many of them will start with small projects Many of them are in the social innovation space because it doesn't require too much money to get a great social innovation project on. They do their own fundraising, uh, crowdfunding. Uh, they design the project, they implement it. But for us, it's to really provide them. It's thinking about what environment will make that happen for them. They're ready to do it. We can put barriers in front of them. We need not to. We need to make sure that we remove those barriers. Providing, for example, I'll just name one, providing flexibility in the curriculum for them to do these things. It may be that one of their course they'll do online so that they liberate a bit of time in their schedule so that they can do this project in the community. It's a simple thing, but we need to think of a different way of constructing the learning environment so that they can really uh, take advantage of the kind of initiative and leadership that they bring already in year one. So this is a good point. I mean, one of the things I think that was a charge of this panel was to think about how do we, how do we find and foster that good research talent. Do we have other, other thoughts we'd like to share about how we best do that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think has been um, finding the talent is, has been easy. Yeah. Um, fostering the talent is the challenging part, uh, not because it's difficult to do the fostering, but because you need the resources to make that happen. And one of the things that, um, from my experience with One Qubit that we saw, was that um, I mean, we had to go outside of Canada in order to find people who understood the fact that you know, you look at so many of these great projects that have happened. We, we talked about the internet. I think the Human Genome Project is another great one. Um, but everything from semiconductors to synthetic biology. When you look at the payouts that have come and the societal benefits that have come from um, pursuing these things, both to private investors and to society as a whole, the returns are massive. And yet, without having people willing to step up to the plate and to support these things, many of those technologies could have either happened elsewhere or happened later or maybe even not happened at all. Uh, and, and I think that would be a real tragedy. So for me, I think the important part is understanding how critical it is, not just from a self-interested desire to make profit, although that's a great motivator, but to really understand that it's in society's best interest to support and to foster these communities of venture capital, government grants, 
to be able to help the people who are coming out of these programs with a real desire to go out and take on the world, to just give them the resources that are necessary to do it. Um, and I think that there's a lot of room for improvement there. Yeah, I, I think that's totally right. And the other thing I would add, and I think this is really important, which is creating a culture that it's okay to fail. Yeah. That failure is not a bad thing, because I think, frankly, too often failure is stigmatized. And you talk about government policies. Um, you know, one of the ones that I think for the United States, and I'm not even sure we really understood what the implications would be for the future, but it's actually our bankruptcy code. Mm -hmm. That if you fail in a business, it doesn't bankrupt your entire life. The business is self-contained. And so that mm -hmm. failure doesn't mean that your entire you know, um, value or your entire wealth or holdings are wiped out. But we need to teach young yeah. people yeah. that it's more important to try, mm -hmm. but it's okay to fail. Yeah. And frankly, the, the key to that is actually learning from your failure. I think that's your point about resiliency to yeah. a significant degree. But I think really changing the way, because I think too many young people yeah. think that failure is a something a sign that they've done something wrong rather than if they fail but then learn from it able you know you look at entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs who you know yeah. failed and then was. was wildly successful learning from those failures yeah I think I'm gonna just say this and then leave it um, but I, I think a, a scientist once pointed out to me that as you go through studies in the early grade the K through 12 grades every problem does have a right answer Mm -hmm. So it's hard for students to get their head yeah. around the, the thing that yeah. scientists do every day, which is mm -hmm. try, yeah. fail, try again, yeah. try yeah, again, yeah, right. fail, fail. Yeah. 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 I think talking about how to help the researchers, yeah. uh, actually in our company, I also have an um, interesting game theory talking about how to split the shares in the tech company between the researchers, investors, mm -hmm. and also the business team. The third, it should be one third for each of them. The researchers have one third, but it's equally important is the business team because they help, help them to connect the market and help them to understand um, the commercialization. Yeah. And investment actually is also very important. One of our investors is sitting here, Peter Liu from Silicon Valley. And uh, he shared with me that investment is like a vehicle. It's not about the money, but the managerial experience from the more senior people and also the resources it can help. So I think these three factors are very important. And adding to that is the government's role. But actually, when we talk about government uh, for research or innovation, uh, people usually emphasize too much on the funding issue. They think the government just put in money for the research, and then uh, it, will, it will take off. But the reality, or, the, or, or something I have been uh, learning or suffering from our, our own uh, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong government is that um, they have put a lot of money into research to help us do all those uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. But um, I think what is more important is the user department to be a pilot user for your technology. Because for us or for the researchers, what they want to see is not just to have something invented, but what they invented make, uh, get its way into the user department to see in the application department. But usually there is a disconnection there that uh, government have money for the uh, research, but they're not willing to try new things because they always entail some risk. And so there's, um, uh, when we talk to the government, they say, oh, maybe, maybe we wait for the uh, advanced country to use it first. Mm -hmm. But when we go to the developed country, they say, oh, why don't your local government use it first? So I think for the government, they should, on one hand, to put money into the research, on the other hand, to be a pilot user to help you to do the marketing and to do the um, uh, uh, validation of the technology. Yes, I think uh, the point I want to make about uh, the European Research Council is uh, the fact that we uh, decided very early on to really put a lot of emphasis on young researchers. And the whole point is uh, in a researcher's career, the moment where you really become independent, you have the ability to develop your own team and uh, it's a very critical moment. So we wanted to, this to happen and we wanted this to happen also for people in a way where they free themselves from their own uh, personal history in the sense that uh, if they really feel they have a great idea, they, sh they can come up with this idea. So then the, the other side of the coin is of course the people who make decisions about to whom we, we give the money, we actually do exert some pressure that they take some risk because uh, actually the academic community tends to be very conservative. So we, we try to tell them we really want them to take some, uh, we want high risk, high gain projects. And therefore we are absolutely willing, uh, that's uh, what you said about the culture of failure. 
yeah. that is something which uh, we are okay with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, we are just at the moment running the an, uh, ex post uh, evaluation mm -hmm. of uh, the program. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole point is to see uh, how things uh, after they're finished, because now we have a number of projects which are finished. Uh, actually, uh, how many of them really uh, led to breakthroughs? How many of them led to failures and, and so on. And actually, I will be embarrassed if there are no failures, because uh, it will show that actually, in, instead of, uh, uh, I mean, listening to us, saying, taking, uh, pushing people to take risks, actually, yeah. they have not taken enough risks. So anyway, we am very keen on knowing what has happened uh, for the program globally. Mm -hmm. I like the resonant idea of if we, if we want to really achieve, we're going to have to take those risks and yeah. we're going to have to figure out ways to support people over time, yeah. whether it's yeah. fostering a culture that accepts that we can fail yeah. sometimes, um, making yeah. that failure protected in certain ways, yeah. um, sharing the risk and investment benefit mm -hmm. over time. I think those are really useful lessons. So yeah. it seems like a good place to um, let the audience ask another question. I still want another one right here in the front. If we could get the microphone out. Uh, good morning. My name is Rami Sharaf. I'm the CEO of Wellbridge Group in Cambodia. The way I portray the whole thing, I portray it connecting it with agriculture. It starts with plowing, then seeding, then irrigating, then fertilizers, then some of the crop will blossom, some of the crop may die, and then we harvest. My point here is this whole process should be with a global scope because there are millions of talents hidden without being seeded or seeds that could not be seeded without giving the environment the right fertile soil where it can blossom and i think the forum can play a major role and one of one of the things that could be done is to go globally and find some mini greenhouse where in association with the governments, ministries of education, academia, universities, where we can announce that there will be a World Forum greenhouse for these young talents at the very early stages. Mm -hmm. And once they are there, let's give them the right soil, soil mm -hmm. and irrigation and fertilizing. This is one point. Yeah. The other point, one of the major challenges that we have is funding. Many ideas get killed because of funding. Mm -hmm. Now, when we have a startup that was lucky to get funded, I think we can recycle or revolve that same fund. When you are granted that fund, you have to sign that once your idea works, you have to adopt another new idea, mm -hmm. and the same amount you got, you have to give back. And this way, we can have the same amount recycled from one idea to the other idea to the other idea without, without the need to knock doors and say, please give me, I need money for mm -hmm. the other idea, like that lucky guy who got the money and now he's, not you personally, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and now who's making millions out of it. So if we can have both the, the, the mm -hmm. agriculture model and the re revolving of fund, I think under the umbrella of, of the forum, that could be one of the best outcomes of this uh, forum. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I really like that idea. Um, the thing that I like the most about it is I, the second part that you talked about, I don't even think that's necessary to put into policy. When you look at the places that have been the most successful at receiving investments, mm -hmm. um, an awesome example I think is Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And when you look at why yeah. we went to Silicon Valley to look for some of our investment, it's because all the way back to Fairchild Semiconductors, you know, the 400 yeah. companies, including Intel, that sprung up from that, guys like Google kind of coming around. These are the people who, you know, the people who were successful there are the people who are seeding the new companies. Yeah. Um, and I think even without making that completely formalized, it's just a natural side effect that if you get a little bit of venture capital, then you become a billionaire. It's almost like a, a natural yeah. part of what you would do with your billions is to give back to it. So you see these hubs with little seedlings kind of spreading up around them and they sort of get watered by the people who had that initial tree. 
Um, so I think that that's something that's, that's very strongly happening just as a natural side effect of those places where there really is some of that initial success. Yeah. It's good to because not all will react exactly yeah. with the same positive. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so nice to see that yeah. it actually does yeah. happen. Yeah. I like your analogy because it talks about sustainability of the whole innovation system. In my sector, uh, the way that it happens is uh, with alumni, actually, who've been very successful and are prepared to be there for the generation on campus, not only in giving money, that's great, <laughs> we like that, but in providing mentorship, networking, opportunities. We're lucky that we have alumni all over the world, and that gives an entry to our students into this, uh, their world everywhere uh, around the planet. That is a way of making it sustainable where generation give back to the other generations and make the whole thing sustainable. So I think you know, it can be applied at every uh, stage of the process of building innovation. I think that's right. And I think they're also looking for various models and adopting it to the local circumstance. Let me just give you a couple. Um, you know, one is just the incubator model, which obviously works very well in a lot of places of giving a space where entrepreneurs can come. And they're actually entrepreneur, experienced entrepreneurs who can help them. And that's something that we actually, as a government, we don't run them, but we seed them. We give seed capital to help start them up and then basically just say go, because it's the ingenuity and it's the creativity of the private sector. Um, another model is taking it a little more global, which is um, the United States government, the Commerce Department, and the State Department have created what we've called the Global Entrepreneurship Summit, which is done each year. This past year was in Kenya. President Obama um, attended, but we're literally bringing thousands of entrepreneurs from around the world to one place together. So you get all these, you know, mostly young people, but some older folks as well, from around the world to come and hear from some of the leading entrepreneurs. And we've actually created a program that we call the President's Ambassadors for Global Entrepreneurship, which is taking incredibly successful entrepreneurs, some who are household names, you know, like Tory Burch, who frankly isn't a internet, but he's created this incredibly valuable, you know, shoe company uh, or clothing company, but then also folks from various different ways and bringing them together and helping them mentor a next generation of entrepreneurs. Um, and I was just actually in Portugal last week talking with the ambassador there about what they've done, which has created a training program for women entrepreneurs and women corporate leaders. So there are a lot of models out there. And part of it is taking it and figuring out which ones work for your country or your area, because frankly, everywhere is a little different in what they currently have and what may work best in that community. Since this gentleman uh, mentioned me as the lucky guy, let the lucky guy say something. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, I believe um, the harder you work, the luckier you are. <coughs> and uh, well, talking about the funding mechanism, actually the Hong Kong government is quite clever. They decide um, funding them. Um, they, for example, it's a one-to-one -one matching. So you need one dollar from the investor before they give you one dollar. Um, so let the investor do the DD for you. And second, they have a 10% uh, clause that for every 10% of the income you get, you need to uh, return this 10% to the government until you fully repay it. And for us, we have paid all the amount back to the government. So that's the good news. Um, and third, we not just return the money, we also uh, provide them some advice for the funding committee. We are telling them that uh, maybe it's not just important for you to fund um, uh, ideas. Uh, you should, um, they now have a new scheme called public trial scheme. For example, if you have a new technology, so the uh, innovation department will pay for that amount for that user department to try your technology. We find that money much more useful because um, you, you, you have the user for this new technology. So it's not just like a new technology, you get a client for them. So this is the um, uh, third, in, uh, uh, also the innovation in the design of the, of the matching. Uh, but we are also actually self-debating the funding, uh, funding mechanism that should we put money to as many ideas as possible or should we focus the funding to celebrate the winners? Because when we see is that uh, we're trying to culture the foster the entrepreneurship environment in Hong Kong, but very important is to have a few winners or showcase. That's how you, like Silicon Valley, you have Google, Facebook, and then all the young people, the talent want to do that. So as in Hong Kong and China, um, but we are still debating, should we like spread the money to many ideas or should we focus on a few, a few winners? 
So um, a, a thing that we've talked about around a bit and uh, was one of the other charges of this panel that we haven't really maybe met head on so much is how do we, how do we protect the intellectual property? You know, what are the ways that we make that in, uh, support of innovation longer term as well? I'd be happy to start. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the aspects of my department is our patent and trademark office, which is, um, you know, the, the leader within the United States government in terms of protection of intellectual property, because protecting intellectual property is a critical piece of innovation and making sure that when uh, innovators and entrepreneurs come out with ideas and create new products, and new uh, value that they're able to protect those ideas that people can't come in and, and take them um, you know and frankly because we, you would never have the same incentive for people to do what they do or big companies would frankly just come along and take ideas and so having a very robust intellectual property uh, protection system but not just by country because frankly one of the challenges we face is this is really a global issue and you know the the creation of value and the creation of content, which um, you know there is there is controversy. Where are the lines? Where is the right place to draw the lines? But making sure that there are strong protections, so that when value is created, that the fee, the folks who have created it are able to uh, get that value off of it over the future without having to worry about losing the protection from it. Yeah, I, I mean that's. Um I have developed a much more nuanced opinion about intellectual property laws as I've gone through trying to build a company that really relies on having intellectual property as we do our early stage research. At One Qubit, um, we've put a lot of effort into developing novel methods to connect this quantum computing hardware to real world problems. And our goal is that you know we came first, we're the first software company dedicated to building software for quantum computers. And our goal is to be able to put that research into you know, this valuable asset. Um, the upside of that is it means we've got a, a real chip when we go and trade and work with larger companies and to be able to say, look, we've done this work up front, it's been successful, you, know, you can work with us and it de-risks your ability um, to get together. Um, but the downside is, uh, one of the major reasons we had to raise money to begin with is because it's expensive to go through that process. And now that we have gone through the process, um, mm -hmm. thankfully Canada and the United States have an excellent uh, patent highway that allows us to really share this. But um, I got to see Jack Ma speak yesterday and um, you know, his company has just announced a, a big um, initiative in quantum computing. Uh, but of course, our patents aren't valid um, over here. And so thinking about like, wow, it would be so great to collaborate, but also thinking, is it safe to collaborate because these things are so regionalized? Mm -hmm. So if there is something that can be done um, to bring a sort of more global community together, if we're looking to have more global um, you know, collaboration and to have companies work together at this scale, there really does need to be a framework because if it costs a million dollars in order to be able to uh, protect yourself to do these things, there's going to be a lot less because that's a very big barrier. Thank you. I think maybe it'd be great to, I see a couple of folks have been waiting very patiently here to, to give a chance, maybe behind me here. Thank you. Just maybe to uh, pick up on the, the last point of Andrew, my name is Pascal Marmi. I work with the, the Swiss government in, uh, in China. I have the impression our institutions are not set up for this uh, global collaboration. I represent entrepreneurs coming from one country to another, and uh, it's to a certain extent a hard job to convince the people of a small country in Europe to invest into innovation that will go out of the country into uh, another one. I think similarly some of the funding mechanism for science, they remain very attached to a national system of yeah. innovation. And then finally, uh, to the university, I uh, would love my kids to be global citizens and start maybe one semester at one Canadian university, yes. moving to European oh. one and others, but no one is going to give them a, a credit for that because they need to stay mm. attached somewhere. So uh, uh -huh. I, I'm just wondering what are some of maybe the creative ideas out there to uh, yeah. fulfill the vision of Andrew? Yeah. 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 Anybody want to try that? Yeah. Well, I'll talk about yeah. the university since you, you mentioned how what great it would be for students to have a bit more mobility. And uh, in fact, this is something that we're working on because you know, we, we uh, create all these uh, networks of university. And our view is that 
they, that is for a purpose and, and we ought to have a little bit more trust and confidence in one another and make sure that when we uh, create these networks then it becomes very easy for students to go from one place to the other and have a very portable uh, system of uh, taking their credits from one place to the other. So that's uh, one area that we're working on. You're absolutely correct. I think that uh, from our perspective, uh, one of the jobs we need to do and do it soon is identify the unnecessary hurdles, speed bumps, all these things that we put in front of people that make that navigating this global environment easy. Uh, and there are ways to do it. Uh, you need to uh, be, uh, I think, uh, determined to do it. And I think that we're at the right time now. It's, it's very important that we put in place an environment that is a lot more fluid for young people to travel in. I think I, I saw an, a number of hands up in this section. Could we give them a chance in the, in the front here? Hand up. Thank you. Hi, my name is Wen Fang. I work for Weatherford. Uh, part of my role is to look at technology development and commercialization. So the thing with innovation is with that comes resistance um, to anything that's new or the fear to change. Mm -hmm. So I think we have done a lot in seeding and getting an idea commercial. But I think what have we done or is there a support framework or structure that's in place now to help with the sustainability of that? So I think one example is, I, I mean, if we look at um, Uber, right, I think the resistance that comes from traditional business that has big funding, that has government support, I think what can we do to help entrepreneur um, help navigate that? I think the gentleman, I think with the idea of you know, the fluorescent fish, I mean, I can imagine public sentiment on genetically modified uh, I mean, the ethical debate around that. So I think what can we do to help a great idea perpetuate? Well, so to your point, and this is, this is an important one, which is government plays a really important role in two ways. One is there's obviously a very important government regulatory role, but there's also staying out of the way of innovation, particularly when disruptors come along. And it is a real challenge because, frankly, and, I, and we've seen many examples over the course of time in our country of entrenched interests trying to use the regulatory process or the legal process to fend off disruptors or new technologies. And so, and, and, and from a policy making standpoint, it's not always easy because you want to enforce the law, but you also have to be mindful of what are the broader implications and how do you allow innovation and development and frankly not closing off your system so that new ideas can come forward and frankly we can fundamentally change the way that um, you know some businesses get done in certain industries so there is a real tension and a real challenge but I think it is an important one for policymakers not to let the regulatory or legal process to be totally overtaken to keep disruptive or new technologies or new ideas out of the marketplace mm -hmm. yeah. the question over here I think we have time for one or two more. So I have a, a, a high-level policy question. Uh, one issue for innovation policy here in China is not just selecting winners, actually selecting kind of strategic industries. Um, I think you mentioned uh, for the manufacturing uh, innovation hubs, uh, for each of these hubs, you actually have a focus, a uh, specific focus, say 3D printing for the first one. How do you balance this on the one hand being uh, visionary and strategic going into the future, and on the other hand, not making decisions of, uh, on behalf of the private sector? And secondly, we know in each of uh, the major uh, countries, we have multiple agent, government agencies responsible for funding or management of the innovation processes. Um, in Europe, we have uh, Commissioner Moedas coming as well uh, from another major agency. How do you collab, uh, coordinate it between these different agencies for innovation policy? Thanks. So can I take the first step of that? Because you've actually raised something that is really important, which is for innovation to happen, you have to have competition. And frankly, government can play a role, but government has to be very careful. And I can give you our perspective, and I think the, a number of European companies share it as well, on what's being done on the strategic emerging industries here, which is if you use it as a way to stop competition and to keep out 
foreign companies, then it's going to fail. You're not going to get real innovation. You're actually not going to develop an industry because it's not going to be globally competitive. And so, you know, I'll give you an example on the manufacturing hubs. We've done, we actually allow foreign companies to be part of them. If they've got operations in the United States, so we actually have a number of non-American headquartered companies that participate in these because of their presence and because of their operations in the United States. But I think there is a real danger, and I think, you know, I've, and I've had a number of industries um, you know, both American, European, and global come in and talk about their concerns about um, the strategic emerging industries here in China and how that's going to choke off competition. In the long term, you're actually not going to let the market work. You're not going to have true innovation. So it's figuring out how to balance letting real innovation happen while also providing an, an atmosphere and frankly an environment and ecosystem that innovation can take place. But using government regulatory policy to, to you know, choke off competition is a very, very um, dangerous thing to innovation. Want to add anything, yeah, actually, um, I wanted to come back to what you said about intellectual property, which of course has been the base for developing a new business. But uh, sometimes uh, business uh, try to be preemptive on things, and actually uh, they try to uh, actually prevent things from happening. So all the debate about uh, uh, open access to, to data mm -hmm. is uh, very much uh, actually concerned by this because uh, depending where you put the uh, limit to open access to data is going to determine very much uh, what will be uh, available and uh, therefore on, at what moment you can start your own business which definitely has to be based on something specific uh, but also uh, in some cases if you if you just uh, block the circulation of data, you are going to make the innovation impossible. So I think uh, determining where you, you, you draw the barrier between what is shared, what is not shared, is actually becoming a very strategic issue and on which uh, it's uh, not uh, clear how we, we should go because uh, clearly the many governments want to regulate on that and, uh, and uh, actually it's basically impossible to regulate on that because you said it's a completely global issue. So if you cannot come up with some kind of a uh, global uh, agreement on uh, a number of issues. So for, for example, some of them have also some ethical dimension. Uh, if you look at uh, anything which has to do with the genome, I mean, definitely there have been a very serious battle about uh, what can be uh, patented about the genome. And I think uh, it was a very important step uh, to decide that uh, actually it cannot be patented because it's uh, common knowledge and it, it has to be shared. So I think this uh, discussion about uh, what can be shared, what cannot be shared, is uh, very central to actually the innovation process because depending where you put it, you can change completely the landscape. So we have just about three minutes left or so, and um, I want to toss what I'm going to say is an unfair question out to the panel right before this. And because and I've been thinking, we've been talking about a, a variety of factors. Mm -hmm. if, if people, so we've, we've presented the audience with a lot of things to think about and chew over. But from your perspective, each of you, if you 30 seconds or so, if there were one thing you would suggest to people they could take away from this to focus on to help foster innovation over time, could you make a recommendation to the folks in the room? Anyone want to start? You know, one of the things that you said earlier was talking about the almost unintended positive consequences of policy and, and specifically the bankruptcy law. Um, thinking to my experience in Canada and something that I would love to share with people around the world is one of the things that made it easier for me to make the decision to not get a real job and to go out and to, uh, you know, when I had really nothing, to risk continuing to have nothing for quite some time was the fact that in Canada we have a reasonably good social safety net, we have uh, health care, and so thinking about, you know, when you're maybe 25, thinking I'm going to put five years into this and maybe five years down the line I'm going to come out with nothing because that's really, that's part of risk taking, knowing that the worst case scenario was not going to be abject poverty and that disease wouldn't ruin my life, you know, that there were things there um, that would be helping me out. So I think partly that sort of like completely holistic thinking uh, was directly impacting my ability to do this. And, and I can say that I'm not as certain that I would have done the things that I've done if I lived in a society that didn't have quite as much of a safety net to help me out. Um, luckily, we didn't need it. Uh, I mean, you know, we, we've been reasonably successful, but 
that was a big factor of being able to take that risk. And I think helping people take risks by limiting the downside is also a big part, mm -hmm. uh, not just sort of rewarding the winners, but also making sure that there is uh, a little bit of a softer landing for the people who are going to try again. So foster and support, limit the risks. I think um, maybe it's a good time for me to do a quick summary of some of the things I've been just struck by while I've been listening to everybody. Um, first of all, I heard a lot about making connections when we talk about why ingenuity is not enough. So to support that, yeah. connections to technologies, uh, connections to policy leaders, to students, to universities, to funders, to finding incentives to other countries. So inviting people in seems really important. Number two, take the long view as much as you can. You have to think sustainably. You have to work um, to face um, you know, challenges that pop up over the time and support on all fronts. I heard applying models that work, which makes perfect sense that we would want to support evidence-based models that work, um, whether they are incubator or networks for manufacturing, things that uh, foster inclusiveness. And we heard a lot about protection. You just left us on that note, but also about competitiveness mm -hmm. and how competitiveness is part of the key to success. And we also heard the theme a lot of going global. So I, I, hope, I hope we've given you something to think about, about yeah. why you know, ingenuity itself is not enough, why we need to create a lot of um, yeah. supportive frameworks around that. And I have to say, I, I can't think of a better panel to address this topic. Thank you very much, everybody. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.